Hey guys, it's Goosebumps Completionist. I'm finally ready to bring you my ranking of every single Tales to Give You Goosebumps short story from worst to best. As well, near the end of this video, I will share my book ranking of this subseries in Goosebumps from worst to best. Now, if you don't know anything about Tales to Give You Goosebumps, this was a short story anthology collection that came out in the heyday of Goosebumps. It released six books, and each book had ten short stories apiece. They often were themed by a certain time of year. Uh, minus the first book, you had just some run-of-the-mill stories. You had some summertime, some camping stories. You had Halloween stories and holiday-themed stories sprinkled throughout the series. And I'll be honest with you. Making this list from worst to best, you know, ranking all 60 stories really solidified in my brain that I have been mixed on this run of Goosebumps um, since day one. <laughs> uh, I am not the biggest fan of Tales to Give You Goosebumps. That, you should know that up front. With that being said, though, I did take away some stories in this series that are some of my favorites of the entire franchise. Now, with also on the inverse side of the coin, some of these are some of the worst kids horror short stories or stories in general I have ever come across and some of my most hated, especially in Goosebumps. But because of that push and pull, I weirdly think about this series a lot. <laughs> and I don't know where this series would rank once I'm done going through every single sub-series and all the stories ever made. Uh, and I do like a, a ranking of the series. I don't know where this would be, but as of now, it's kind of near the bottom <laughs> somewhere. Maybe not the total bottom, but it's down there. Um, but that, I'm not trying to undersell this series. Literally, there's so many people that remember some of these stories because some of these stories were turned into Goosebumps episodes. And by all means, I totally get that. And there's some hidden gems in this that are must experiences that most you know hardcore fans will tell you about. So if you're not familiar with the series, please, before you watch my ranking, go take the time to read a few of these. Or maybe read the whole series if you can. I know that the book five and six are hard to access, but if you can get your hands on them and try them out, go read them first and then come listen to my ranking. And please, before we get into my ranking, there's 60 stories, so I'm going to be barreling through these, minus my bottom five and my top five, which I'll go into more detail on. Uh, let me know down in the comment section what were some of your least favorite stories from this series and what were some of your favorites. Or maybe what was your favorite books in the series or, or what what were your least favorite books. Stuff like that. All right. So since we got 60 stories, I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to go into a little more detail on my bottom five. And then from then on out, we're going to kind of barrel through until we get to my top five. Okay. So. I'm going to let you all take a guess on what my number 60 is. The worst Tales to Give You Goosebumps short story, in my opinion. All right, you got your guess locked in? All right, so number 60 goes to Monster on the Ice. This short story was featured in Tales to Give You Goosebumps book number 6. More and more and more Tales to Give You Goosebumps. Now, the reason why this is my lowest rated or ranked story in the entire run of these uh, books is for the fact that I'm a massive Haunted Mask fan and a massive Werewolf Skin fan. And this story tries to blend both of them and, try to, and tries to play on the formula, but it's so mind-numbingly dumb and the concept is so goofy and the twist is so laughably bad, I have no words. And it's, it's in my opinion, it just spits all over what I love about Haunted Mask and Werewolf Skin and it creates a primal hatred within me. So the concept is, this is all you need to know. A hockey player gets a new pair of ice skates that turns him into a monster slowly, like a hairy monster. And he spends the whole story going through this ordeal and, the, and he arrives to the twist. And the twist is so mind-numbingly dumb that it just sinks all potential fun and charm that could be had in it if you did find it charming. Like I said, I just hate this one deeply. It was one of the only two that I gave a flat one out of five stars. Uh, my harshest rating I can possibly give on this channel. I hate it. It's one of my least favorite Goosebumps stories of all time. There you go. And my <laughs> number 59 is almost just as hated. If it wasn't for number 60 being the way it was, this would definitely be my bottom. 
And my number 59 goes to Something Fishy. This was a short story featured in Tales to Give You Goosebumps, book number two. Uh, I think that one was, uh, what was it? Even More or More Tales to Give You Goosebumps? I forget what it was called. Uh, but it's the second one. More Tales to Give You Goosebumps. This one is just another one of those so dumb, it's kind of an annoyingly dumb kind of stories. Uh, the premise is so asinine and the twist is so bad, uh, it makes me full on hate it. So you have this annoying kid, he has a fishbowl, uh, he, he's kind of playing God a little bit, uh, and somehow the fishbowl is able to make him into a, a fish size and he falls into it. He has a close encounter with a fish inside of his bowl, I think it's a betta fish, uh, and he goes through this whole ordeal trying to get somebody to rescue him and pull him out, he finds a way out, then the ending, implies that he's going to do this all over again for fun. It's insane. It's insane <laughs> how bad the ending makes the whole rest of the story make, seem like a waste of time. Not, not only that, it's easily one of the most annoying characters. I only remember the character's name, but I don't care to. Uh, yeah, it's just not something I care for, nor do I want to uh, <laughs> go any further with. It's just absolutely awful. It's the other one I gave a one out of five stars to. So there you go. At number 58, we have another story from the sixth collection, More and More and More Tales to Give You Goosebumps. Uh, this story is actually the final one ever for the whole series. It's Attack of the Christmas Present. Now, <laughs> this one is a mild step up from the bottom two, but then again, like most of these in my bottom ten you're going to see, or just near the bottom half, you have these semi-serious tone stories that have just a goofball, corny twist that just completely 180 the story's tone and ruins it. Uh, no different here. So the concept is, kid on Christmas morning, he opens up a present, he gets this robot. The robot may or may not be following him around, uh, might be mildly intimidating. And then the twist comes, and uh, turns out the robot just wants to play a game with the kid, like tag. And that's literally where the story ends. It's so dumb, and it's so goofy and corny, uh, I really have nothing positive to say about it. As a matter of fact, I don't even remember why I gave this one a 1.5 out of 5 stars. Maybe for the fact that there was some tense moments involving the robot where the kid thought that he was being stalked by it. I thought that that was kind of creepily written. Um, but yeah, this one is just a wash. <laughs> Very forgettable story. And if it is memorable, it's memorable for all the wrong reasons, in my opinion. All right, at number 57, another 1.5 out of 5 star uh, short story here. This one came from Collection 2 again. Uh, <laughs> as you can tell, Collection 6 and Collection 2, I think, had some of the worst stories in the whole run. Um, but this story, I can understand some love from some people saying that this is a parody on the trope, but this is my most hated trope in Goosebumps history, the you gotta believe me story, uh, trope. And as a matter of fact, the story is called You Gotta Believe Me. Yeah, this one has some mild setup and payoff satisfaction. I think that's why I gave it a 1.5 out of 5 stars. It does feel a little bit whole. But man, is the trope just wearing itself thin, even in a parodic fashion. And all it is is the most generic thing ever. Uh, a kid thinks that he sees aliens. He goes around ch telling people that you, they need to believe him, need to believe him that. And then, kind of like here, you just get some generic twists where the aliens uh, are there. And then people maybe might start to believe them. Uh, yeah, very generic story. <laughs> and I have the uh, original comic art from FBX up here for it. Um, and I still do not like this one. It's just infuriating. Uh, all the tropes I hate are full-on blast here. And I can't even enjoy them in a fun way uh, because it's still overused here. So, whatever. Very forgettable. And uh, to round out my bottom five, before we start barreling through uh, some the rest of these for a little while, uh, this one comes from the first collection, Tales to Give You Goosebumps. Uh, and this one, I think, was like the fifth story in that one, and it's called Good Friends. Good Friends, by every stretch of the word, is an all-for-nothing story. <laughs> I mean, nothing in this story matters. It's a huge recontextualization story where uh, everything is hingent on that final moment. Um, and it sucks because m for the most of it, it's fine. Like in just like an average kind of way. But then 
that recontextualization hits and you realize that this was really nothing to be caring about. <laughs> you thought it was going to go a whole different direction and involve some imaginary friends, right? You have this kid and his friend are looking to pull a prank on his friend's sister who has an imaginary friend, uh, but there's a twist involving the imaginary friend thing and uh, uh, it's not what it seems in the bad way in probably the worst way possible. This could have been a good story if there was a little more care put into the plotting of it. This is definitely one that I think could have been fleshed out maybe into a triple header story and made way more creepier and effective. Um, and they could have played more into this mild psychosis element. But because of the page constraints on this one, um, this one feels like a knee-jerk reaction slap in the face. <laughs> and I hate it for that. So that's why it's on my bottom five. All right, so the rest, we're just going to kind of plow through these uh, to, uh, to keep the pace going for the video. I'm not going to spend too much time on these. Uh, number 55 goes to Nutcracker Nightmare. This one was in the sixth collection. Nutcracker Nightmare is a meandering story. Uh, it's about like a Nutcracker play and this girl's at this play but it turns into a time warp thing and nothing happens for majority of the story and then by the end you realize it's an all for nothing story. Yeah, not for me. <laughs> this one was pretty bad too. Uh, same score as the other ones but uh, I, I gave this one a slight edge over the bottom five just because the aesthetic is there. I don't know. The play. I thought that was kind of neat, I guess. So there's that. Number 54, we have The Spirit of the Harvest Moon. This came from the second uh, book in the collection. And this was the final book in that, uh, or the final story in that book. Spirit of the Harvest Moon, in all sense of the uh, imagination, is just a very cheap version of Ghost Camp. Now, I know this story came before Ghost Camp, and there is an eerie urban legend that has some legs going for it but it's so predictable uh you can i easily predicted where the twist was going to go within the first page and a half <laughs> and that should tell you something so it's more annoying to read through this knowing that it's playing you know a paint by number story and then you get this twist that is so goofy uh and such a 180 from the tone uh, of the rest of the story that it makes me full-on hate it so that's why it's here it's just a really goofy cornball version of Ghost Camp. There you go. Number 53, we have Strained Peas. Now, this one was in the first collection of Tales to Give You Goosebumps. And, yeah, this one was not good whatsoever. This one was pretty bad. Um, and a lot of it has to do with how it handles the subject matter of the story, more so than uh, the rest of it. I, I don't mind the idea of having uh, an older brother getting a new younger sister that's like 12 years younger than him and he's kind of like lashing out for attention um and maybe the sister might be a monster but everything that happens in the story is circumstantial and it's never really played up into a reveal that this little baby is actually a monster so it comes off really redundant and there's just missed opportunities in the story uh that i wish tied better thematically because for a goofy tone story uh, especially in Goosebumps, there needs to be some themes to make it worthwhile, and it's just not worthwhile here. So that's why it's in the bottom 10 worst. It's just the execution's awful. There you go. And number 52, we have another story from the sixth collection, the, the Christmas one. Um, this one is Santa's Helpers. Now, minus the, the twist being really good, honestly, I'll give I'll tip my hat for the twist here. The rest of the story is so bland it's almost offensively dull in every sense of the word. You have these two kids, uh, they're in the North Pole, Santa's Village, and they're just doing nothing. They're just kind of just hanging out there, I guess hiding out from Santa. I actually forget what they're actually doing there. Uh, but Santa Claus near the end finds out that they're there, and uh, the twist is really dark. I like it. Uh, but nothing happens in this story. It's just really dull. I mean, missed opportunity. I've said it in the past. This would have been a fun episode but I think in the right context, it would be a fun episode if the writers from the show made it good. <laughs> so there you go. All right. And to round out my bottom 10, we have a story that I think actually deserves more hate <laughs> than it actually gets. It's a story from the fifth collection, the first one from the fifth one we're going to talk about. And it's uh, The Ghost Sitter. This story is just very generic, cliche, by the numbers. Uh, which is fine and all, 
Um, it had it had an eerie setup to like you know these two two friends are like trying to figure out uh, where this babysitter or said sitter is going to be. Uh, there might be a miscommunication of the houses, but man, where the story goes is just really goofy. And the twist has to be one of the worst Goosebumps twists I have ever read in my life. I'm not even going to spoil it. Uh, it's awful. <laughs> and I think it tanks it down to the bad territory um, for an otherwise middling story already. So yeah, Ghost Sitter rounds out my bottom 10. All right, keeping it at book number five. At number 50, we have Something Strange About Marcy. Yeah, this one's an infamous one. Uh, it's basically an all-for-nothing story in a, in, a, in a lens. You have a kid suspicious about this new new girl named Marcy. Uh, she's acting weird. Can't really pinpoint what's going on with her. And the twist ends up being so goofy and out there. Uh, and it's played for laughs in, in some of the cringiest ways possible. Um that I have no words. <laughs> now, the only reason why I kept this out of my bottom 10 was because I think it was done this way on purpose. <laughs> uh, it was trying to be kind of clever, and it mildly is, in that, like, mild, so bad, it's good way. Um, but, yeah, if you haven't experienced this short story before and you get hit with that twist, this is going to be the probably one of the top three most divisive short stories in the entire run. So... There you go. Just know that before you go into it. But I did not like it whatsoever. So there's that. At number 49, we have another short story from um, book five. We have Stuck in 1957. This one is such a big missed opportunity. Uh, it's a time travel story uh, involving hairdos and stuff. The main character goes back in time in some weird, loose way uh, to 1957. And of course, like the title kind of spoils for you, uh, he, there might be stuck in 1957, uh, and it plays up all the 50 stereotypes, you know, the big beehive hairdos and like, greaser stuff. I mean, it's all in there, and it's played in such a corny way. Nothing about it is scary. Um, if you want a time travel story, go read Cuckoo Clock of Doom. Don't read this. This one was pretty bad, uh, if not just poorly handled. All right, so number 48, we're kind of getting into that meh territory now. These are just flat mess for me, like not good, not bad. Um, we have Teacher's Pet from the first collection here. Teacher's Pet is a story where nothing happens, basically. <laughs> it's all set up. There's uh, fake out dream sequences uh, with the main character. Uh, the main character and her friend, uh, they get, you know, inaugurated into a new school year, first year of middle school. They get this teacher named Mr. Blankenship, who's obsessed with snakes. And uh, there's, like I said, dream sequences of snakes uh, and, you know, just snake cages and snake, you know, terrariums all over the classroom that's supposed to be scary. Uh, and it's played into a twist where it could have been scary, but it's played into more of a uh, gotcha kind of twist, which is mildly clever, which is actually a redeeming thing about it. But yeah, it's mostly a, a nothing story. <laughs> So there's that. At number 47, we have a very mixed ep uh, mixed short story in the community, and it's Suckers. Suckers is such a random story. It almost feels like an, uh, a fever dream in a little uh, bit of ways. You know, a couple of kids stumble across a chest on the beach, I think, and they uh, come across this monster that uh, sticks to them, and they have to pawn it off to some other people. That's literally the story. Um, and there's really no rhyme or reason to who they pick minus a morality play on, uh, I guess it's playing on the lesser of two evils tropes. But still, it's it's basically a nothing story and nothing actually scary comes out of it. The twist is just very mild and kind of tame. It's whatever. <laughs> it's just a whatever story through and through. Very forgettable. That's why it's there. And number 46 uh, another mess story. This is the actual first story from book three. <laughs> it's been a while uh, since book three gets brought up here, but uh, we have easily the weakest one from that one, and it's Change for the Strange. This one is about like a kid going to a thrift store and finding something uh, that may or may not bring out some animals on the on the clothing print, and the thrift store owner might be behind it. I forget the exact details, but it's just a whatever story. It's another one of those tame ones. Um, 
yeah, nothing else to say about it. <laughs> so there you go. And number 45, I think this one is a little bit overhated. It's commonly put in the bottom 10 of these short stories from people. And I can get why, but then again, I don't. Uh, it's an amusement park story. It's from book four. This is the first book four I'm talking about. And it's uh, Please Don't Feed the Bears. This one has the same twist as a most wanted book. Uh, the special edition book, Trick or Trap. It's basically the same idea. But this one has a fun setup. Uh, imagine like Horrorland, but with Care Bears. A uh, girl and her little sister are having some spats. Uh, the older older sister gets taken to this Care Bear amusement park. She wants nothing with. She gets separated from her family, gets lost in this weird part of the park where like employees only uh, are hanging out at. And uh, something weird goes down with some stuff. Uh, people wearing like <laughs> the bear suits. <laughs> Um, yeah, and the twist is kind of in a mean-spirited way, uh, very reminiscent of Trick or Traps ending. Like I said, if you, if you read that book, I'm not going to go any further. I don't want to spoil it. Um, I feel like the wrong person gets punished here, but in the same way, uh, whoever does get punished was still annoying, so it's fine for that. But this is another one of those mess stories, or I guess pushing okay for me. Nothing too special. Now at number 44, this one is just okay. Uh, this also comes from book four. This is The Spacesuit Snatcher. The Spacesuit Snatcher is a very forced story because this came in the Halloween collection and they were trying to force Halloween elements onto it. But I dig the setup here. We're starting to get into more positive leaning stories. Uh, this girl goes to like a yard sale and finds something for her collection. She's into like trying to communicate with aliens. And whatever she buys may or may not succeed in that. Uh, and there's a really dark twist involved with it that I was kind of impressed with. But then again, the page constraints and the forced Halloween aspect in it uh, does not help it. <laughs> it's very uh, forced, I should say, uh, and kind of rushed through. Needed a little more breathing room. The pace was kind of whatever, uh, but it was okay. That's all I'll say about it. At number 43, we have another story from book six. This is kind of a step up from the other ones we've been talking about for that book. This one is The Marshmallow Surprise. If you've read Hansel and Gretel, it's basically that just reimagined. But the atmosphere in this one's really nice. It has a nice little snowy cabin type of vibe. And it's kind of eerie. But what makes this short story as high as it is, I know this is not a popular one, just like Please Don't Feed the Bears, uh, but the twist on this one is pretty dark, and I enjoy it. <laughs> and it involves the kids and uh, in a Hansel and Gretel type of way, but the roles are kind of reversed. It's hard to explain, but I dig it. Uh, other than that, it's just okay. All right, at number 42, we have probably one of the biggest disappointments of the whole series, and it's uh, Strangers in the Woods from Collection 1. This one had a pretty solid monologue with the main character. Uh, the pace was really nice for the first two thirds. And then, you know, it's building up the story where this little girl is sent off to her estranged uh, aunt's house for a little while while her parents are overseas. And something might be wrong. Something might be unsettling her with her, with her and uh, what's going on with her aunt and why she's not allowed in the woods and why her dog's acting weird. But once you start getting the answers... It's just really goofy, and it's it, it's kind of like you're going full speed, and you're getting into this eerie or maybe mysterious plot, and then you immediately get hit with an emergency break and thrown into goofy crap. That's what this is. <laughs> and then the ending is so forced on there, it hurts. <laughs> uh, with a twist involving the aunt, I'll just leave it at that. But uh, yeah, uh, had some potential to be one of the greats, but it just didn't do it and just ended up being okay now uh to round out the okays here we have a story from collection five and it's live bait this one i can't really remember much about i just remember that uh there's like this weird shack where these kids find some bait or some like worms or something but they end up getting more than what they bargained for and might end up becoming the bait themselves for some twisted fisherman cool concept just weird execution and weird direction choices that feel really forced and padded. Um, 
it's done in a more goofy way than it probably should be. Uh, I guess if you have thalassophobia and are afraid of fish, you might like this. I mildly enjoyed one scene involving uh, the water location they were in, um, and I thought there was an effective thing there. But other than that, the story was kind of a wash. <laughs> so there you go. <clears throat> uh, all right, so now we're entering the stories that I think are ironically decent, okay? And some people might disagree with this. I know this is a hated one out there, but at my number 40, we have For the Birds. I know this story is goofy. I know the the, the family kind of sucks, <laughs> this story. You know, you have a family on vacation. They're at this resort, and there may or may not be something really wrong here with the people running these resorts. And then there's a big recontextualization about the family. Um, a, a similar twist to this, I, if I can kind of pinpoint it, is if you've read Night of the Squawker... <laughs> <laughs> from Slappy World. Think that here. Um, but there's there's some fun little clever moments with the main character. I, I really enjoyed the monologue. Uh, it had some genuinely funny humor. Uh, it was just really kooky and weird. Um, kind of padded. Not a lot made sense logically, but it's an enjoyable one nonetheless. It was decent. <clears throat> and number 39, this one has to be one of the most overrated <laughs> short stories of the whole collection it's the werewolf's first night okay let me just be up front this one is just decent kind of average okay but that does not mean that i'm saying it's a bad story whatsoever no it's enjoyable but it plays on all the clamp uh, camp cliches from beforehand and it does nothing new with the werewolf concept essentially it is it's it's essentially like as my friend bd horror put it if you've ever seen the afraid of clowns episode specifically the episode from the haunting hour show just make it that but with werewolves and you throw in some camp cliches that you've seen in pretty much every single goosebumps camping story there you go that's all you need to know <laughs> okay um it's like a coming of age story basically whatever uh there is that frightening scene with the cabin and i will say that was pretty metal okay other than that this is average all right, and number 38, this one is a Gremlins ripoff <laughs> from the Holiday Book, book six. Uh, it was the first story in that book, but I actually had a lot of fun with it, even though it's just an average one. Uh, it's Don't Sit on the Gronk. Yeah, it's it's a silly, you know, kid acquires like a Gremlin-type monster, uh, has instructions, you're supposed to follow them, they disobey the instructions, and uh, monster make mess, let's just say that. <laughs> <laughs> it's goofy it's corny but it's charming i don't know i, I like this one in it like i said an average decent way all right at number 37 this is probably the most average story of the entire run here uh it's mirror mirror on the wall from club book number five if you've read let's get invisible ghost in the mirror you've read this but this one did introduce some tropes that ghost in the mirror would borrow because this one did, of course, come after Let's Get Invisible. And I do like some things that it adds to it. Like there's a hand mirror involved. Uh, but it's basically the same premise where uh, I think a girl sees a reflection in the mirror. Uh, the reflection may or may not try to take over her life, blah, blah, blah. There's a hand mirror involved that gets her out of the situation but might create some other issues. Um, it's fine. <laughs> it's something you haven't seen before. Uh, it is played kind of creepy, though, and I will give it that. Um, that's why it's on the uh, pushing the middle of the pack here. Uh, we're starting to get to the good stuff. So it's pushing good, just in that decent way. All right, at number 36, now we're starting to get into the uh, outright uh, average but good. <laughs> we have The Chalk Closet. This was the first story in uh, book number three. The Chalk Closet might be mildly outdated because nobody has chalkboards anymore in schools. But this story was just straight up dark. And kind of eerie. Uh, you have a, a teacher uh, threatening kids to put them into this chalk closet for misbehaving. Has a lot of mistrunchable vibes from Matilda going on. And I really dug that about it. Um, unfortunately, we don't really get to see what the chalk closet does live and in color. But we get to hear some implications going on. And uh, there's moaning. It's just, it's just an eerie story. But there's nothing about it to make it pop. There's no pizzazz to it. It's just averagely good <laughs> that's all i can say about it really so yeah there's the chalk closet 
Same thing can be said about my number 35. Uh, it's the very first short story of the entire collection, The House of No Return. Now, I said it, and I'll say it again. The House of No Return is another overrated story from this collection. Because it's the first, I feel like a lot of people love this one. Um, but honestly, I think a lot of people are confusing the love for the episode. Because uh, even though Chris Wakeley is an iconic character, I think he's way better there. But this one is fine. Uh, you have these three jerk kids who have this danger club, want to recruit this new kid on Halloween into their club forcibly. But it backfires because the haunted house they've been picking to recruit may actually be haunted and might do something to them. It's just very basic, and the entire story is, is played on initiation and uh, subverting the expectations of the audience, so it's hinging on the twist. But the twist isn't that spectacular because it ends before we get to see what happens to them. So it's one of those that you have to use your mind to fill in the implications and all that. I can get what it's going for, but it's still just very basic and just average, but in a good way. And that's all I have to say about it. All right, now we're at number 34. Now this one I think is an underrated one, but not in the top five most underrated or anything. But uh, uh, we have Fun With Spelling from book five. This one was such a fun story uh, in like a fantastical way. Uh, I don't want to give away too much, but it involves like a girl getting a spell book and might be actually accidentally making spells and she realizes it. And then it goes too far. <laughs> And let's just say that. And it goes, it goes in a semi-dark and comedic way, which I like the blend here. Um, the only thing is, for me, is that it's kind of lacking in the pace department. It could have been fleshed out a bit better. This is definitely one that I think could work as a full book if Stein wanted to or the Ghost Rider wanted to. Um, and I think it, just, it needed more room to flesh out some ideas. Uh, but the scenes we got was really cool. Um, like I said, I just wish we had a little more uh, time to build with the concept. Uh, and there were some goofy moments. I can't exactly remember what it was, but yeah, that kind of rubbed me the wrong way, but uh, a little overly goofy. But this one was pretty solid. Now, at number 33, this is an overhated one. Again, uh, this comes from book number four. It's The Wish. Now, The Wish is pretty much be careful what you wish for but condensed down into a short story like it should be. Uh, this one, uh, it, it takes place on Halloween, and there's a creepy woman that hands his kid like a rock stone, and he ma makes a wish that he knows he probably shouldn't make, but the wish definitely backfires, and it turns into a very mean-spirited story in a cautionary way to teach the reader and teach the main character a lesson about uh, appreciating what you have in life. I, I get it as a thematic story, if you look at it from just a literal sense, it's not that great. But thematically wise, it does what it needs to do. It has a good atmosphere. Creepy creepy woman handed out the stone. I enjoy it. So there's that. And number 32. This one, now we're starting to get to the ones um, that I actually full on like. Okay, so this is like the, the good half. <laughs> we're, we're halfway through. Um... And number 32, we have Aliens in the Garden. This was from book number three. Uh, this one is a classic subverting the expectations from the reader, but in some of the best ways possible. Uh, so, like, I think, uh, what is it, a brother and a sister, or maybe a girl and a friend, or a guy and a friend, I forget. Uh, but they think they see a flying saucer crash down in the garden in the backyard during a thunderstorm. Uh, but some bully kid finds it and picks it up, and they realize that there might be some life in and beings on this crab so they have to try to figure out how to save these creatures from this bully uh and when they find it uh it ends up being something that you don't expect <laughs> look inward look in a mirror and see what you look like and think about how the aliens would look yeah i'll leave it there it's very twilight zone-esque it's pretty much a play on twilight zone uh and i like it for that i almost full-on love it uh, the only thing is, I think it's actually straight up robbing a story from Twilight, almost verbatim, uh, minus the fact that the saucer landed in the backyard. Uh, it's basically the same thing. Uh, and there's also, you know, the added element of the bully character being annoying and all that. Uh, but yeah, whatever. Uh, Aliens in the Garden, pretty good. At number 31 is an underrated one. Uh, it's Tune In Tomorrow from book number five. Tune In Tomorrow 
is such a fun story. I think it this would have been a great episode. Uh, it's like a, a girl, she's experienced a show, she's experiencing a show that she's found on TV, but it seems to be mimicking her life. And she goes throughout this story thinking that maybe, you know, reality shows and reality itself sometimes kind of blend. And then I guess that's the, the idea it's going for. But the twist, <clears throat> it, I think, was a, a bit too ahead of its time. And it's also a bit too ambitious. There's just not enough build there uh, to kind of buy into it. I feel like the story needs a little more fleshing out. Uh, it came off kind of last minute as a result. Um, and also, I think the characters could have been a little bit better written. And uh, there could have been more to it. Uh, like I said, I think it, if there was this was an episode, they could have fleshed the idea out and made it even better. Um, so yeah, a lot of potential there. Just didn't have the room for it, unfortunately. So now we're in the top 30. And if you uh, remember my review way back when of book six, I've definitely retroactively bumped this story up. I used to not like it, but since I've had years to process it, I think I like this one a whole lot more than I used to. And that is The Ice Vampire. This one is a fun, creative story. And I can see why this one's a fan favorite for the creativity. But to me, it's just really corny and silly um, <laughs> in some facets of it for my liking. But nonetheless, <clears throat> you have uh, an ice carving competition. These kids, they carve a, a vampire. Vampire comes to life. And they have to figure out how to get rid of it. Uh, and they figure out that maybe melting it might be the best, best way possible. Uh, and these ice sculptors that seem to be around them might be coming to life as well. Uh, it, it's a fun story. It's very creative maybe could have been a cool concept for an episode i really don't see how they could have pulled it off uh but since there's not a lot of vampire tales and goosebumps this one was fun it's fun enough okay so it's good i'll give it that at number 29 we have a story that lived on to become a full-on book essentially uh, we have the cat's tale from book number two the only reason why i have this one at number 29 and not higher it's because the fact that Cry of the Cat exists, okay? This is the precursor to the Cry of the Cat book. Essentially, if you've read Cry of the Cat, it's it's this, right? A cursed cat <laughs> comes across the main character, starts to do some sketchy things to the main character, and the uh, character has to figure out how to get rid of the cat. There you go. That's the plot. Uh, it's tense, has some uh, creepy moments, some really solid jump scares for a book. <clears throat> or a short story for that matter. But then again, like I said, uh, especially after experiencing Cry of the Cat and seeing how more fun the concept is in a full book form and just how wild Cry of the Cat was, I just feel like Cry of the Cat is that necessary rehash and that reimagining of this. So uh, it just looks inferior in comparison. It's, it's, it's hard to kind of describe how I feel about it, but if Cry of the Cat didn't exist, this probably would be higher, if that makes any sense. So yeah, there's that. And number 28. Now, uh, I did not expect this one to rank this low, but I had to be honest with myself. Uh, it's Click from the first collection. I know Click is a fan favorite story, but the reason why I put it here, kind of similarly to The Cat's Tale, is that Click did get an episode. But the episode is so good in comparison to this, and I hate to do this to this on its own merit, but the episode does so much a better job characterizing a kid that gets a universal remote. It even makes a cooler concept of how he acquires a remote. It plays better into the morals of the button pushing and what they're doing. It's showing you the story as opposed to telling you the story uh, in, in terms of the writing, I guess the ghostwriter uh, took in the approach of handling it in the short story format. It's just a better product. And there's actually a mild villain that's introduced in the episode that's just absent here and this one does have its thought-provoking moments, but then again, it's just not that special. Seth Gold might be one of the more memorable protagonists from this uh, series of stories here, but his monologue is kind of trash in this. Uh, and uh, the prowess is not great. It's just barreling through plot action, the whole story, and that's why it's here. It's just not enough meat on the bones for me. So there's that. And number 27... This one is definitely a choir taste, if I've ever come across it in uh, Give Yourself Goose... Oh, not Give Yourself. Tales Give You Goosebumps. Uh, but this one I really enjoyed. It's called The Scarecrow. This one was in the uh, fourth collection here. 
And uh, this one was pretty good, I would say. Uh, you have these three kids. They find this scarecrow. It's coming up to Halloween. Uh, they realize that the scarecrow might be leaving them presents. And when they put on these presents, they, there might be a cost with what they take. Uh, and these presents might be linked to the desires that they have. It's, it's a weird idea. The only thing is, is that some of the ideas aren't fully fleshed out or even answered in the short story. And it feels kind of hollow by the end. Some things are left unexplained. I feel like if this could have been a full book, it would have been one of those weird experimental Goosebumps books that definitely would have had a cult following more so than a, a mainstream following. But I dig the concept of this. Uh, it's definitely uh, a memorable one. I, I think about this one sometimes. Uh, so yeah, it has that going for it. <coughs> All right, at number 26, we have a story from the first collection. It is How I Won My Bat. How I Won My Bat is not everybody's cup of tea, but I enjoy this one. Uh, you have a struggling baseball player, gets a bat from a mysterious figure. There's a cost to pay. The kid ignores the cost. And it might come back to bite him. It's a good cautionary tale. Uh, the villain's creepy. I think this could have been a fun episode to see the villain on screen. He has that mild Carl Knave uh, presence to him. Uh, I just wish there was more to his character. I feel like there's some missed opportunities there. Uh, and there's just not enough to chew on plot-wise. So, there you go. Alright. <clears throat> At number 25. Now we're in the top 25. We have Poison Ivy from book number two. For a camping short story, like a, like a legitimate summer camp, this one's cool. Uh, you have a, a group of campers that experience uh, this deadly poison ivy growing across their camp, especially in this baseball field, and they have to figure out how to eradicate it. It's basically a creature feature, but in a Goosebumps short story, kind of similar to another story, or, or I guess the next few, actually. These are like the creature feature ones. This one's just fun. Um, I think they probably could have made this in the show back in the day since they made Stay Out of the Basement. But you would have had the Stay Out of the Basement uh, plant crawling effects, I'm sure. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. This one could have been fun. Uh, it's plant-themed horror. That seems to be a popular subgenre in, uh, in the Goosebumps community. People love Stay Out of the Basement and Your Plant Food and Poison Ivy. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's a fun, very good story. There you go. Number 24, same thing. This is a Halloween one, and I've said that this would have been a fantastic episode, and I truly mean it. It's Pumpkin Juice. Pumpkin Juice would later become Full Moon Fever in Series 2000, and Full Moon Fever is definitely the lesser version of this. But the concept of this is just so much fun. You have these two kids, they find this recipe book on Halloween. They create the recipe out of pumpkins, uh, pumpkin juice, if you can imagine. Uh, and when they take it, they fail to read the instructions, and it may or may not turn them into beasts, and they have to spend... The rest of the night trying to figure out how to resolve the situation and the twist is really fun and it it kind of leads into mild sequel bait but i don't know if the the short stories ever would have entertained sequels but yeah very fun one and in the typical goosebumps sense that you can imagine uh, so yeah there you go very good all right another creature feature we have number 23 awesome ants from book number four awesome ants <clears throat> The short story compared to the episode, I think the episode has a lot of elements that I wish were in the short story, but it's a fun concept. A kid wants to make a project. He orders something from a comic book, which is a really cool setup. It's an ant farm. He feeds the ants too much. The ants grow too big. And then uh, there's a twist involving how, you know, if mankind plays against nature, nature is going to end up playing with mankind. It has a morality play. It has a theme. It's actually one of the more well-realized stories. The only problem I really have with it is two things. It's in the Halloween collection. Why is it in the Halloween collection? And like I said, the episode has some other elements that in hindsight definitely improve it. Just doesn't have it here. Um, and I'm not going to lie, there's some left field things, especially by the end, that just, whatever. <laughs> Plot convenience in motion. But yeah, very good story. At number 22, we have uh, a Night of the Living Dummy clone from book number one. But this one is pretty good. It's Mr. Teddy. I've said it. Mr. Teddy would have been a great episode for the show uh, in that Night of the Living Dummy kind of way. Uh, Mr. Teddy's creepy. Uh, it's about this uh, girl who gets a new teddy bear uh, and her sister might be jealous. And like I said, it's a play on Night of the Living Dummy. 
Uh, and there's some fake outs potentially involving the sister being behind these pranks, involving uh, her, her collectibles getting ruined, and the teddy bear being kind of framed to being the device doing this. But it actually may be the teddy bear. But there's another thing in the plot I don't want to spoil that is recontextualized to be the real villain that is kind of cool. Um, yeah, it had a fun twist on it. Without the twist, this would have been a, a considerably lower, probably in the upper 30s somewhere. Uh, but the twist really gets, you know, gets some brownie points for me. Uh, there are some laughable, uh, corny things about the story that just aren't believable. You know, like you have a teddy bear trying to strangle a girl with... How's that scary? Uh, <laughs> how's a teddy bear going to wrap its little arms, T-Rex hands around a girl's neck? Beyond me. But other than that, really effective story. All right, at number 21, we have a story from book number three. It's Home Sweet Home. Home Sweet Home is, is, is pretty much a clone of another story higher on this list uh, called Broken Dolls. But I really dig this one. Uh, and it's, it's essentially the same idea where uh, this girl comes across this doll and there's like a villain involved and the girl has to deal with the villain and the doll in the same, some, in almost a similar, if not identical fashion as Broken Dolls. Um, and there's some heartfelt moments to it. I really dig this. It's a really cool story. Um, and that's all I have to say. It's very good. At number 20, we have a story from book number five, The Haunted Guitar. The Haunted Guitar uh, is, a, is a very basic one, and it's not going to be this special for a lot of people. But what re really sells me on it is the like second half of the short story. The setup is fine. This kid breaks into this old, broken-down music store, finds this guitar, takes it home, um, and he wants to play it. And he ends up getting visited by the spirit that can possibly teach him how to play, but there's some twists involved with that. Uh, and some gifts and takes, and he might have stumbled into a hellish nightmare <laughs> involving that. Um, it's very haunting to think about it. I think the ending sticks with me more so uh, than most of these short stories here. So, very memorable one. I love this to pieces. At number 19, this is another one of those underrated stories people just don't give enough credit to. It's from the fourth collection, and it's called Bats About Bats. This one has a lot of similar elements to A Vampire in the Neighborhood, which is a bit higher on my list than this. Uh, but this one is very, very fun. Uh, you have these girls having a slumber party with this one girl. And there may or may not be some stipulations about somebody being a bat. <laughs> and let's just say uh, it gets wild. <laughs> it gets very wild. Uh, it's, it's a fun one. It's very loose in logic. There are some mold over things and the reveals there is some mild pacing issues but uh very fun story that's all i have to say and number 18 definitely one of the most creative stories i saw in this collection here it's matt uh matt's lunchbox from book number five this one is absolutely fun <laughs> uh it's about uh this boy he gets his lunchbox from his mom he doesn't like the lunchbox it's not the kind he he really wanted but things keep turning up in the bottom of his lunchbox. And, uh, and it turns out that everything that he's putting in there is possibly feeding some type of creatures in his lunchbox. And he has to keep them at bay. Or they might try to eat him. And that's the premise. It's, it's really fun. It, it's almost like a Tales from the Crypt type of plot. And maybe that's why I love it so much. Um, I just wish there was a little more to it uh, than what we got. I feel like there could have been a, a possible triple header story maybe a full book idea to come out of this i don't know um but I, there's just not a lot there uh and there are some loose things dealing with logic and dealing with the mom that don't make no, much sense but i love this one at number 17 we have another story from the fourth collection it is the goblin's glare this one is basically a clone of a of another story way higher on my list and it's a clone of a famous Goosebumps book. It's actually the first to do this type of plot. If you've ever read I Live in Your Basement, The Goblin's Glare is like that. But this is a very fun and unique way of handling the story. So it's around Halloween, and this kid has this compulsion to draw a goblin drawing because he wants to hang it on the front porch to scare kids during trick-or-treating on Halloween. But 
the thing that he's drawn may or may not have created a portal to have that drawing come to life and like a dreamscape be time away. It's very Freddy Krueger-esque and it's kind of morbid <laughs> to think about. But if you're a fan of like A Nightmare on Elm Street, it's definitely playing more on that um, than I Live in Your Basement does in a lot of ways. And I think it's just effective at what it is. It's definitely a lesser version of I Live in Your Basement and, and, and another story we're going to be talking about. But I still really enjoy this and I love it in a lot of ways. It was probably my personal favorite, but not the best from the fourth book. All right, at number 16, another one of these overhated personal favorites of mine from this series. It comes from the first book, and it's A Vampire in the Neighborhood. Kind of similar to Bats About Bats. This one is just, uh, it's kind of a messed up story, but in like all the best ways possible. Uh, these four girls, they see this new girl move to town. Uh, they wonder if she's a vampire because she's so pale and she lives in this old creepy house and they spy on her. Uh, and they get to a point where they get caught and they just flat out ask her and they learn the truth and then you realize what's going to happen after. I don't know. There's not a lot to this one, but what it does is so effective. And I just love the banter and it, it just, something about the story feels realistic. I don't know what it is, um, but I just love it for that. And that's why it's this high. All right, at number 15, we have a story from the last story to cover from the first book. Uh, and it's Broken Dolls. Broken Dolls, I think, is the better version of Home Sweet Home. Um, even though you don't get the first person emotions or monologue, I think Home Sweet Home has some of the best monologue from this. But this is told entirely in third person. The Doll Maker is one of the best villains in the whole Tales to Give You Goosebumps lineup. Um, and the concept is really fun. Uh, this girl and her brother they go to a shop something happens to the brother with this doll maker he ends up getting sick she has to kind of figure out how to fix him when she uncovers bits and pieces about the truth and uh there might be a good victory for once <laughs> a character get, gets a good ending um it's just a, a whole feeling story it's kind of whole i don't know it just it all fits together like a puzzle piece and it works splendidly well all right, at number 14, we have P.S. Don't Write Back. This is from the second book. This one uh, is a haunting tale. Uh, it's about a kid who thinks that his family doesn't want him anymore because he's trying to write letters out to him while he's at summer camp. Uh, but it seems to be that somebody's writing him saying, uh, you know, you're, n you're not wanted anymore. And it, the kid starts to kind of spiral and you get to uncover all these emotions and all that, and then you get to learn what actually is going on. And uh, it's even more messed up than what you think it would be. Um, it's just a fun, engaging story that has so many twists and turns. Yes, this probably could have been a full book, and I think this would have been one of the emotional classics uh, of the series if it was able to do it. But uh, yeah, phenomenal story. We're starting to get to like the great greats. Uh, of this uh, collection here. At number 13, we have a story from book number three, and it's The Thumbprint of Doom. Um, this one is played 100% on realism, and uh, it mainly plays on psychic skepticism, I think that's how you say it. Uh, but man, is it so entertaining. Uh, the characters in this rule, the monologue rules in this with the main character, it's kind of like a revenge story, uh, but not really. Um, <laughs> uh, and yeah, it involves maybe a kid going to a psychic, thinking that they get powers, but it might be in like a placebo kind of thing, dealing with like the thumbprint of doom. It has some like legend to it. It's so much fun. You just have to read this one. You don't. You might not think it sounds that special, but it is. It's great. All right. Number 12, in my opinion, is definitely the most underrated story of the whole bunch, the entire series. It is uh, I'm Telling from book number three. This one is essentially another play on Cuckoo Clock of Doom's idea with like Tara the Terrible and Michael Webster, except these characters, you have uh, a kid who has finds his gargoyle out in the woods and he has this gun and he soaks up some goop coming out of the statue and his sister threatens to tell and he shoots her with the goop and it turns her into a gargoyle statue. And he spends the whole story trying to fix her and figure out what to do. And then uh, once he manages to probably fix her, he realizes that uh, maybe sometimes impulses 
are just as good as, you know, decisions that you put thought into. Sometimes you should trust your gut and keep things the way they are. Sometimes uh, you have to make tough decisions that uh, might affect other people, but it's for the it's for the greater good. You know, <laughs> and there might be some selfish motivations near the end, but I, I just love this story. It's very thought provoking. It brings a lot out of you. Uh, just like how some of the greatest creep show sh uh, segments from the creep show franchise does, um, I love it for that. It's very mature, and you want to think that, but it is. It's really cool. Um, so yeah. Now my top eleven are all perfect in my opinion. So this is really hard to gauge, but we're gonna try my best and work our way up to the top five here. At number eleven, uh, I wanted to put this in my top ten, but I had to be real with myself. Uh, I just love these other ones a little bit more. And I picked The Perfect School. This was in book number three. Uh, Brian O'Connor, still one of the greatest Goosebumps protagonists of all time, even in the short story. I know there's different mechanisms on how uh, these copies of characters are done in the short story versus the episode, uh, whether the robots versus actual human clones. Um, and there's some story elements in the episode not present in the short story. Uh, but, man, is this story cool. Uh, a troubled kid gets sent off to a school, like a reformatory school by his parents during the summer. Um, and he has like a coming-of-age self-discovery moment. All the while coming across some ghastly realizations about what's going on in the school and how they're <laughs> reforming these kids. And you learn the ghastly truths along with the character. The character has a great monologue. It's very well written. Um, it's just, there's something missing there that I think the episode just brings, even though the episode, I think in terms of points is a lesser thing. It's just, it, it needs a little more attention. It could, definitely could benefit from being a full book and that's why it's here. So yeah. And number 10, we have Attack of the Tattoo from book number four. This one is a great concept. It's super fun. It's about uh, kids that find these tattoos at the bottom of their trick-or-treat bags on Halloween. And uh, they put the tattoos on. Uh, and this, the main character has a tattoo that turns into a snake and a haunts her at night. It comes alive when the moon's out. And there's some stipulation with the moon. And, and there's actually some cool uh, ways that, that ties into the back half of the story. And there's a fun plot twist involving some other kids that got some tattoos and stuff. Uh, and there's cliffhanger sequel bait <laughs> to work with. I mean, very well told story. Uh, that's why I gave it a perfect. All right, at number nine, we have A Holly Jolly Holiday. Now, this one is a fun inflection about people who don't like the holidays. And if you're that kind of person who just kind of resents going into the holidays because you're not a big fan of the, the cliche Christmas stuff, this is for you <laughs> because it's a commentary on that in, in a very mature way. Um, you know, a family, they come across this VHS tape uh, that has a Susie Snowflake on it. <coughs> but when Susie Snowflake comes on, there might be some uh, mind control possessing stuff going on with everybody who uh, watches it. And it's kind of infectious and it makes everybody kind of a uh, mindless zombie for the holiday, you know. And it's kind of playing on that idea that like, Christmas movies get everybody all hyped up for Christmas and you know, Christmas this, Christmas that makes everybody, you know, controlled. Uh, it, it's a it's a fun little inflection piece. It's definitely commentating on something, and I think it's very smart. Gotta appreciate it for what it is. And number eight uh, is one of my personal favorites, but I just love these other ones a little bit more. Uh, it's Don't Wake Mummy from book number three. Don't Wake Mummy is a freaking short story masterpiece, if only for one mild element. Um... But it's definitely forgivable. But other than that, the concept of a family getting shipped a sarcophagus to their house and then having <laughs> to deal with accidentally opening the sarcophagus, unleashing this, this mummy's curse, and having a fun little uh, tie-in with this younger brother trying to get some uh, leverage in his family, uh, especially against his older sister. And then we get this dynamic storytelling where they shift perspectives and the sister might get some actual comeuppance. It's just a fun tale, all, all said and done. It's very creepy, it's very eerie, and it involves parents in, in a lot of ways you never see in these Goosebumps tales. So, gotta give a lot of props to it. At number seven, we have another, I think, masterpiece 
for this subgenre in Goosebumps specifically. Um, and it's like the movies, uh, the movie themed ones, uh, like Fright Camp or A Shocker on Shock Street. And that is Dr. Horror's House of Video. This story is just very chilling. <laughs> it's super chilling to think about. And it ends on a cliffhanger before we can actually see the grisly fate of the main character. But it works in that way that your, your mind can fill in the blanks, but you kind of know what's going to happen to him in a sad, unfortunate way. So this kid, he's like a big movie buff. Uh, he's going on vacation, but he asks that he gets to go uh, to this video store nearby and this video store makes like homemade like smut films essentially uh <laughs> well now i want to say smut but like uh x-rated horror films let's just say that they're, like ultra violent and they're they're filmed on on house or something and he wants desperately to watch these but the guy offers him that he could play a, a starring role in one and that's been his dream is to be in a horror movie but it backfires, and uh, it's one of those things where you just got to be careful what you wish for. It's just a typical cautionary tale. It does nothing new with the cautionary element idea, but it's just the way the story executes itself is just so much fun. The lizard men creatures that we see in the movie, A+. Plus. That's all I have to say. One of my favorite short story villains from Goosebumps. <laughs> Alright, at number six, uh, this one is easily the darkest. <laughs> short story in the entire run it comes from book number two and it's shell shocker this one shocked me shocked me the first time i read it and i it's grown on me quite a lot um than what i used to think of it over the you know, past few years but this is an absolute masterpiece um this girl finds a shell on the beach and the shell might be talking to her uh, the shell's instructing her to go to a certain part of the beach and she's increasingly scared and worried that she shouldn't be doing this and she's kind of going against her gut instinct to do something right. Somebody might be in trouble. And then a revelation comes and she didn't trust her intuition and it backfires for her and she suffers a grisly fate, essentially. It's that up front about it. <laughs> uh, it's, it's absolutely incredible. It's incredible. I have nothing else to say. Go read this if you haven't read it, please you'll be shocked all right now we're at the top five absolute best short stories from the bunch here um at number five we have a story from book number six uh and it's the double dip horror this one is easily i think the best written story uh utilizing the page constraints the best has the best twist has the best build up has the best character monologue probably some of the best atmosphere as well but the only reason why it's here is because it's ripping so hard into the Shining's twist that if you know what to expect with that, uh, it kind of kind of hurts it because you're expecting you're kind of expecting this type of twist, and that's the sad part. But it's still executed really well. It's still executed very well, even though it's like I said, if you're programmed to know where it's going. Uh, but this is absolutely incredible. It's about um, this, I think, I think it might be a, a pair of sisters or maybe this girl or guy, I forget. Uh, but this kid or kids are at the ski lodge and uh, they're skiing and all that. And there's an instructor and there might be um, some shining type of twist where uh, this instructor or these the, this pair of people that they see on this really hard part of the ski trail might actually be dead ghosts. And uh, they learn this at the 11th hour, but there's a huge plot twist <laughs> of all the who's actually dead. Uh, and uh, yeah, wow. <laughs> um, and that's how, you know, it's very The Shining-esque, like I said. <clears throat> um, but yeah, definitely one of my favorites of the entire uh, Tales of Giving Goosebumps series. Uh, but number four, I love this one a little bit more. This one is just a cozy, eerie uh, read. I mean, it's perfect for what it is. The tone is great. Uh, and it doesn't do that goofy shift ever. It's just very poignant. And I can totally see why a lot of people say that this is the best one. It's the Haunted House game. The Haunted House game is a masterpiece, just like Double Dipped Horror. This one is just an eerie tale. Uh, it's kind of playing on the same ideas where, you know, there might be ghosts, but there's a recontextualization about who's been dead all along. Uh, but it's told in a simple way. Some kids get bored. They pull out this board game. 
in their helm during a thunderstorm. Uh, but as they play in a similar fashion to like a Jumanji, uh, stuff mimics the game and mimics what they're doing. And it's very haunting and chilling. <laughs> That's all I have to say. I mean, it's just a very well-written story. And it's to the point. Uh, the character monologues are nice. Uh, you can definitely feel the fear of them bouncing off the page. Uh, there's some solid emotions, a very solid reveal near the end. It's just a perfect package, honestly. Uh, but I don't love this one as much as I love my top three. My top three are my absolute favorites. Uh, and my number three might shock a lot of you. This is easily the most controversial short story, or and possibly one of the most controversial stories in Goosebumps history. Uh, this one's perfect, in my opinion. It's a perfect thematic tale about growing old too fast and uh, experiencing life before you get to, uh, you know, enjoy your youth. And that is an old story. An old story is definitely playing into some taboo things. We're dealing with, um, you know, child trafficking. That that is a, that is an outright plot theme in the story. Uh, you do have context of. Uh, the main characters, Tom and John, being <laughs> sold into marriage. But unlike some other icky stories in Goosebumps, this is the only one where it never really goes too far with it. And we never actually get to see uh, bad endings for these characters because they come out on top. They have a good ending. Uh, and they actually kill a villain on page. It's insane. So... The villain is Aunt Dahlia. She's a famous villain in Goosebumps. Aunt Dahlia, she was in the episode as well. Even though the episode has some mild tweaks, it's more so the same. Uh, she is set to watch Tom and John while their parents are gone. Uh, they've never really gotten to know Aunt Dahlia. Don't really know who she is. But uh, she gives them these prune cookies because they're hungry, which they're kind of afraid of eating. Uh, and then they start to feel strange. And the next day they start turning into old men. And they uncover the grisly truths about what happened with those prune cookies, what Aunt Dahlia is planning on doing with them. And it's definitely playing into the ideas, because we see this in the monologue of Tom, about him growing up too old, uh, too quick, and uh, how he hasn't really been able to experience life. And these kids pretty much go on a vendetta to get their revenge and get turned back to normal. And it's a harrowing tale. And the ending is so troubling, and it's so mind-bogglingly frightful to imagine the implications of i really have no words and the fact that this was in goosebumps it probably shouldn't have been but holy crap <laughs> this was way better than it deserved to be if people hate it because of the icky stuff i beg of you i beg of you to look at the outcome of the story before you just sit there and bash the ickiness okay if you don't like it for that fine but please Stop saying it's bad just because that stuff is in it. They come out on top. Especially more so in the episode. But yeah, that's all I have to say. Alright, now in my top two. These two are my most beloved. Uh, number two, we have the last story from book number six. And it's Why I Hate Jack Frost. Yes, Why I Hate Jack Frost is an absolute banger and a masterpiece. Um, Jack Frost, easily the best villain. Next to my number one's villain, in the entire Tales to Give You Goosebumps lineup. Jack Frost is conniving. He's what Keith in I Live in Your Basement should be. Um, <laughs> no offense to Keith lovers out there, but Jack Frost is better. This man is nightmare fuel. Uh, and especially when you see the main character go through his encounters with him. You know, this kid, he inquires an ornament in a department store. But as soon as he puts the ornament in his tree in, like, Arizona... While he's dreaming, he gets transported into this snowy realm that Jack Frost controls. So he's pretty much like a Freddy Krueger type. And Jack Frost essentially wants to make this kid his slave and imprison him in this world. Uh, but the kid has to kind of like fight, sleep, and get himself out. And uh, <laughs> throughout the story, it gets more and more unnerving where Jack Frost is like purposely making his skin cold. And making him like feel uncomfortable and making him... Uh, in pain so much to the point where he starts cringing and kind of shedding tears from the pain level it's that deep with it i mean this villain is just intimidating and frightening and the ending is so dark i love it <laughs> it's so dark i love it 
for a dreamscape story, you do not get better than this. It's absolutely fantastic. But my number one, my number one favorite Tales to Give You Goosebumps short story of all time, of all time, is the final story in Collection 5. It is What's Cooking. Chop Suey is the, one of the best villains of Goosebumps of all time. I said it. I made a top five video a long time ago um, talking about my top five favorite Goosebumps villains. Chop Suey is on there. Chop Suey is basically Candyman uh, from that classic movie with uh, Tony Todd. Yeah, he, that's what this character is. And if you put in a little bit of uh, Bloody Mary. Uh, this story is an urban legend. It's kind of like a scary stories to tell in the dark tale, more so than a Goosebumps story. But this is so frightening and so chilling uh, to even think about that I'm shocked that they didn't want to put this into like a darker Goosebumps book in like later OG 62 or maybe in series 2000 because I think this would have worked splendidly well in like that mild slasher way. And it does have that uh, summertime vibe because it is summer school. So these two kids, they uh, have to go to summer school because they have bad grades and uh, all the kids at summer school are talking about this lunch lady known as Chop Suey. And there's some urban legend about how Chop Suey might have chopped up some kids and fed them to a bunch of other kids in like some cannibalistic way. Uh, and something happened to her where she died and she said to haunt the school. But if you chant her name, she'll come back. And the kids are like, yeah, whatever. We don't buy into that. And they chant it like they, they, they do have a dumb moment by doing that. But they're more in, so in the naivety of it all. Uh, and they bring alive this this being but they don't know who it is until later on in the story and you figure out what's going to happen to them uh and the ending is so fun in a cute way um it could be considered corny by some but i think it ends it off almost in a perfect way um yeah it's just amazing it's outright amazing it's one of the most scariest goosebumps stories i've ever read especially for this series uh it was fantastic absolutely fantastic and it's honestly probably in my top 10 all-time favorite Goosebumps stories, period. So, yeah, that's my short story ranking for the series. And now really quick before we head out, I'm just going to show uh, what my book ranking would look like from worst to best um, in terms of how I would rank them in terms of favorites to least favorites, stuff like that. All right, starting off in Dead Last, we have the fifth collection. This one was just whatever uh there's a lot of middling stories even though it does have my absolute favorite one in there uh what's cooking and it does have matt's lunchbox everything else about it i can live without if i'm being perfectly honest there's only two stories i would revisit and it's the least <laughs> that i would so there you go all right at uh number five we have the sixth collection sixth collection is very weak almost half suck or some of the worst stories four out of the my bottom 10 come from this uh but some of my favorites like like i think two out of my top five come from this at the same time so it's very all over the place but i'm not willing to curb this one as much just for how insulting some of the bad ones really got so yeah there's that at number four we have the first book um there's no perfect story in here uh, as a matter of fact, my favorite one only managed to scrape my number 15 overall and my 60 short story ranking. Uh, so nothing higher than a 15th slot. Um, there are some revisitable ones in here. The, the quality is a little more consistent. But there are some really terrible ones in here, like Good Friends, Strain Peas, Teacher's Pet is whatever. Um, so it has some bad ones in there. And the memorable ones could be a little bit better. And they're more on the underrated side. And there are also there's also some overrated ones in here too. So that's what lands it here. Now, as promised, like I mentioned in my Tales to Give You Goosebumps uh, book review for, you know, my most recent one, my last one I did, I said I was going to curve this one. This is uh, book number two, More Tales to Give You Goosebumps. I'm curving this one because even though it has similar quality issues like book six, it's a lot of crap. Some of my least favorite stories in the history of this uh, subseries is in my bottom 10 from this book. But the highs of this definitely outweigh the highs of book one. Um, so I'm curving this one to be higher than that. So, yeah, there you go. 
Now my top two, it's pretty much a runaway with these two. These two are just have such high quality compared to the other four, in my opinion. Uh, maybe not the highest of highs com in comparison, uh, but uh, definitely more solid overall. Um, my, my second favorite one is definitely the Halloween book, book number four. This is a fantastic read. Almost every single story really clicked for me, minus two. Eight are super revisitable. Uh, and actually, this past Halloween in 2023, I read a few of these out of here just for casual. So, yeah, it's saying a lot. Really enjoy this book. Really enjoy this one. Definitely a higher-end Goosebumps book. But not as high as this one. It's very close in quality, but this one just has the best consistency out of the whole series. And the best one, in my opinion, is book number three. Without a shred of a doubt, some of the absolute best stories, just banger after banger after banger, especially in the first five of this book, is in here. It's incredible. The quality consistency is amazing in this collection, and that's why it's my favorite. So yeah, sorry for such a long video, but we had 60 short stories and all this to cover. Whew, we did it. All right, so... Thank you guys for sticking with this video and watching all the way through. Let me know down in the comments section, what did you think about my ranking? Did you agree with it? Did you disagree with it? Like I said early on, uh, let me know what your book ranking would be for this series. Uh, what your uh, top five favorite short stories from this series are. What your top five least favorite. Um, and let me know your thoughts on it. I know that I said that I'm not the biggest fan of this series, uh, but I kept an open mind and I had quite a few surprises and uh, some of these I will definitely keep with me. So yeah, until next time, take care.